Welcome to the Chicago Bears Podcast. A presentation of ESPN Chicago. Chicago's home for sports. Here's your host, Pat, the designer. Bear on, Bears fans. Chicago, what is good? We are back for another edition of the Chicago Bears podcast. The Bears are off, but we're not. As we got stuff to break down, we're talking about position battles on today's episode. Also, can the Bears go from worst to first? They've done it quite a few times, actually, which is not good, but also kind of good. Let's hope we can sustain this one. And then we've got all uh, the biggest overblown story of the offseason. Got to hear that from Courtney as she's had to report on quite a few of them. By the way, Courtney Cronin in the building on a Tuesday. Courtney, how you doing? I am good. It's nice to kind of be in summer, but like you said, I mean, the Bears are off. We're not off. You're pumping out five days of a week of podcasts, which is craziness. And I am in awe of of how you can come up with everything to talk about on a day-to-day basis and keep it fresh. But that's what we do here on the Chicago Bears podcast. We keep it fresh. We give you great perspectives. You get you know, myself, former players, you get Yurko. Like, what's not I get to Yurko. love? I get Yurko. I, Yur- Yurko's a man. Like, Yurko's the, the, my favorite one because it's just like, so what happened in 1998? Let me tell you, kid. It's like, okay, I right, sweet. Story time. <laughs> Story time with Yurko is, is fantastic. I mean, his his Rolodex of people that he knows and, like, the encyclopedia that is his playing career and yeah. everything he knows uh, about this team and everybody in the division is is marvelous. Story time with Yurko is always awesome. We got some we got some interesting stories today, though. Surprising me a bit as we jump into this thing. By the way, hit that like button, subscribe to the page. I didn't forget about it. Drop that like right now. Stop playing with me. Drop a bear down if you're a real Bears fan in the building, man. Let's get into the first quarter because... First quarter. The Bears have surprisingly gone from worst to first quite a few times. Uh, in 2001, the Chicago Bears did it. They went from 5-11 and 11 to the next season, 13-3. and three. They did it again when they went to the Super Bowl. Season before, or not Super Bowl, but season before the Super Bowl, uh, 2005, 5-11 five and 11 to 11-5. and five. They've done it most recently in 2018, going from 6-10 and 10 to 12 and four. And of course we know how that season ended. Robbie, we'd have loved you to be there. I know, you know what, maybe one day we'll talk about that on the pod. Don't worry about that. Still hurts. Uh, But Courtney, can the bears do it again? I mean, this is kind of crazy. This is in a 20 year span. Basically the bears have gone from worst to first three times. Can the Chicago bears do it again this season? 20 year span with how many different coaches? Because a lot of times worse. How many first, different quarterbacks? I mean, yeah, that's the real question. But I was thinking like Dick Jerron, Lovey yeah. Smith, yeah. Uh, Mark Tressman, John Fox, Matt Nagy. And now we're on to Matt Eberflew. So six coaches in a 20 ish year span. I don't even want to know the quarterbacks. I mean, I was trying to like do it in my head. Fields, Trubisky, Cutler, uh, then before that, like Kyle Orton grows. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. I love but, that you're just naming the starters, not the guys that were like, Hey, can I play yeah. here for a week? Oh, Matt, appreciate Matt it. Barkley, <laughs> does that count? Like, I, I mean, had he, faith in Matt Barkley, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> he might have he been came out, and he was hitting mugs in the hands, they so was dropping the football. <laughs> I believed him a little bit. <laughs> it's, it's an idea that we have floated now that the bears have gotten out of the really, really hard part of the rebuild, which was the teardown phase. Yeah. And there's an idea that if you spend one year just doing the absolute hardest part of the job, trading away your star players for draft capital, accepting that a three and 14 season, as much as it may be difficult to stomach is Mm -hmm. probably the likely outcome then the natural feeling is that brighter days will eventually be on the way because you wouldn't do all of that just to expect to stay at the basement of the NFC North and the basement of the NFC. But the example I like to use, because I mean, those bears examples you brought up, I mean, what's been the consistent thing have not found their franchise quarterback have not had, you know, a receiver that, uh, I mean, DJ Moore came here with his, you know, 5,500 plus receiving yards and immediately jumped to the top of the list of, receivers that have produced uh yeah. in bears history topped all of them they haven't done certain things to adapt to modern times in the nfl and now they have a chance to do that so the example i like to use that i often bring up is the cincinnati Bengals because people look at them and say man worst to first draft joe burrow first overall in 2020 yeah. get to the super bowl a year later and of course it's always possible 
But I had to go back and take a look at what their roster was like, Pat, because, you know, going going with like Cincinnati Bengals were in this tough spot. So like, let's go back to like the 2010. So Andy yeah. Dalton's their quarterback and, you know, they're a perennial wild card team. The AFC North was tough. So even if they were like the third team in the AFC North, like they would still make the playoffs. They did it in 2011. They made the playoffs in 12, 13, 14, 15. They lost the wild card round in every – they lost in the wild card round every single year. Like, they were a perennial averaging out to a 9-17. and 17. That's who yes. they were under Marvin yes. Lewis. So, eventually, the bottom fell out on that, and they were 6-9 and nine in 2016. 7-9, 6-10, 2-14, and 14, Zach Taylor's first year after yeah. they had finally parted ways with Marvin Lewis. I – think that people kind of have the whole worst to first idea about the Cincinnati Bengals and when that actually happened, they have it wrong because yeah. Zach Taylor took over in 2019. Yes. Andy Dalton was still the quarterback then, but that's really to me when it began, because like the bears, when they were a two win team, they had to start tearing down that roster. So this wasn't a two year process. You get your franchise quarterback and then you get him a number one wide receiver the following year in the draft right. and everything just ascends from there. What they did after drafting Joe Burrow, because of course it all starts with the quarterback. And if the Bears bet that Justin Fields is going to be the franchise guy, can take off in year three of Fields, then they will have already crossed that 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 hurdle. We don't know that just yet. We've got to see him play games this year to see if all of the pieces have come, you know, the fa falling in place the way that they need to. But you know, Joe Burrow gets hurt his rookie year. It's the ACL injury. Like, then he comes back. And so what they did in that 2021 season, kind of similar to what the Bears did. They went out and got a superstar wide receiver in Jamar Chase. But then they also had a really good free agency yeah. where they got Trey Hendrickson. They got Mike Hilton. They got Larry Ogunjobi. Um, uh, Chidobe Awuzie was there, too. Like, they went out and added to the defensive side of the ball – and they were able to take advantage of the AFC North that year where, you know, Lamar's coming off of his, uh, you know, record-breaking rushing rec quarterback rushing record the following season in MVP year in 2019. The, the uh, Cleveland Browns were, you know, a good team that year. They made it to the postseason in Pittsburgh as well. But they, they had the best quarterback in the division in 2021, the year they went to the Super Bowl. Now, can the Bears get there? Sure, but there were less holes on their roster because of what their situation was, where they were able to, you know, draft, develop, bring in a number one receiver in the draft, and also have pass protection up front. Like, they really, that's like kind of like the, how, the like, uh, not talked about thing enough in what we saw in the 2021 Cincinnati Bengals. And I was actually just looking up, like, what that depth chart looked like that year. You've got to think about how much, you know, how many resources they added up front. I'm trying to pull it up right now um, to, to help them, like to get them to a point where they were going to like be a Super Bowl team. Yeah. And they ended up spending, you know, a significant amount of draft capital that year. I mean, Jonah Williams was a first round pick in 2019, the year they were not very good. Um, you know, they, they brought in Riley Reef from Minnesota. He played right tackle. Like they spent on the offensive line and it got them to a point where yes, Joe Burrow was still one of the most sacked quarterbacks, but, and that was their flaw in the Super Bowl. but they at least had talent up yeah. front. And I don't know that team, that team is such an outlier because it worked, but you can still poke holes in what went wrong for them. And of course we go back to the Super Bowl game. You're like, how many times is this, is this guy going to get sacked before he seriously yeah. gets hurt? Yeah. Um, so I don't like everybody asks, like, can the bears be the Cincinnati Bengals? Like this version of the Cincinnati Bengals. If everything pans out perfectly, yes, things got to break their way. But I just think that they are not there. Like you go back to Ryan Poles's quote from free agency, that they're still going to have holes on the roster and expect that that's probably going to be the case. Now, yeah. Worst to first could end up meaning three and 14 to eight and nine. That's like a worst to first sort of trend, but it's not going to be worse to top of the division. I just don't see with how Detroit has continually steadily built their roster and added every single year, especially up front on the offensive line. I mean, they've been doing that since 2016. I don't see the parallels, um, you know, in the division of anybody else that like, 
has been in this situation before and also the fact that those teams have also been building towards staying sustainable where the Bears are just starting to get there now. I, I think the Bengals is such an interesting one because I think even rookie year of Burrow, you knew like, oh, oh, this is this is the guy. Like this is like he if he could stay healthy, if they could protect him, my guy. He, it, that's still the case. By the way, protect this guy. Like he's still leading the NFL like at the top of the the guy's sacked list on the quarterback. Like maybe maybe help him a little bit. But I don't look at it so much as a Bengals situation because the Bengals in a tougher division had to fight their way kind of to the top. And it was very unexpected based on the people that they were going up against. Mm -hmm. And they had a hard division. It's probably harder than what the bears are going to be in this year in a wide open NFC North. So again, a lot of things had to break their way. I think. Could they be the Jaguars though? That's that's what I that's kind of the team that's, that I that's see. That's your worst to first right now. Nine, I mean, I, I look at the Jaguars. I don't see a division in the NFC North where I'm like, yeah, I can guarantee somebody's gonna win 12 games. Mm-hmm. So that means that everything's gonna be pretty close. Even if the Lions win get 10 wins right, I still see second place being right there. Jaguars last season, nine and eight, Tennessee seven and ten, Colts four and twelve. Houston three and thirteen. I don't think we have the four and twelve team. Maybe we got the three and thirteen. The Packers' schedules is definitely suited for Aaron Rodgers and not for Jordan Love. So we'll see what that's kind of kind of going to be. But can the Bears have a worse to first in the sense of yeah, it's still a mediocre season at the end of it, but it is absolutely showing that vast level of improvement, and it's absolutely showing that they're just not in a division that's oh my god, we can't beat anybody. I mean, they have to. Yeah. They have to show improvement. And I don't I don't think worst to first is realistic, but I think worst to second, worst to third Ooh. could, you know, that that should be where they're shooting. Might they get yeah. there? No. You know, they might not. But to go from three wins to 13 wins, like the, I don't the, see that. That's just yeah, look at their that. schedule. I mean, yes, there are a couple games where you can feel confident if you're a Bears fan projecting out what's gonna happen that even on the road, like that they might be okay in a couple places. Maybe that's Tampa Bay week two of the season. And of course they've got Arizona at home. Like those are some games where you're like, okay, like the strength of this team right now should be the DJ Moore, Justin Fields connection should be improved pass protection Mm -hmm. should be some of the things that would combat a defense like Tampa Bay, which we know is pretty stout defensive line, but is, you know, age regression all those things factored in but 10 wins to expect like that much improvement there's a reason it doesn't happen that often you need so many things you need a lot of luck Uh, so many things to break your way in order for that to happen and i just don't think it's wise to project that for the chicago bears when the worst of first teams we've seen like the cincinnati Bengals, have been an anomaly because they yeah. haven't been worst at first and then fell back off. They were in the AFC Championship nice. game last year. Those yeah. Bears teams you mentioned. They all uh, fall off. They all fell off. Like they the all fall year, off. It was, you know, they, they, <laughs> there was something. And I think that's what Ryan Poles has gotten at. You know, the quick fix thing. And, yeah. you know, he's not, you know, I was, you know, working on this feature on him. And we talked about this lesson that he, like a financial advisor, uh, you know, relayed to him and it's something that you teach children about delayed gratification so if you can have one piece of candy now or if you wait three days you can have the whole bag and that's the mindset he takes into how he approaches roster building and making sure that this team is going to be built towards something sustainable because you know you mention it in well they went from 5 and 11 and 17 so it was the last year of fox um you know trubisky was still the quarterback was that was his rookie season and then next year they go 12 and 4 with a historically good defense after making the trade for khalil Mack, pairing him with akeem hicks um leonard floyd's on that team the corners were good like i mean but like think about some of the things like you weren't sure that were going to pan out who's i mean the name escapes me right now who's the cornerback that they didn't pick up his fifth year option all of a sudden he balled out kyle fuller so do you can you they didn't, they would have picked up his fifth year option if they were going to project that he was going to have a great season. Yeah. A lot of those things go hand in hand where it's like, yeah, you could, didn't project this. So the surprise success that you saw was more of a byproduct of right place, right time, right move versus yeah. long-term sustained success. 
I think the thing you mentioned there that's so key with this team, not again, I don't know if they'll go from worst to first. I do think that worst to second is a possibility because I don't know what the heck's going on with the Vikings. Like, I thought the Vikings were a lot more stable. They seem kind of a mess. I'm not going to lie to you. Like, I, I'm looking on in, in Viking land. I'm like, I don't, I don't feel like this is a team that won 13 games last season. This feels like a team that won five. Uh, and <laughs> at least how they're trending again, uh, sustainable success. Nobody yes. looks at that 13 win season and says, <laughs> man, gosh, like, you know, they were the better team in a lot of those games. A lot of things broke their way. How many one score games did they play in? Yeah. That's and, when you expect the regression. Won. Yes. <laughs> yeah. like, that's when you expect the regression to happen. And it's okay that it does because teams like that are not built to be long-term you know, long-term contenders, long-term yeah. trying to, I mean, and then you get in trouble when you try to run things back that are not meant to be run back, which the Vikings have tried this whole soft rebuild, competitive rebuild <laughs> thing, like rebuilding the shadows while our stars continue to get older. And then we yeah. trade them away or we release them. I don't know if that's the right method of business. And it's absolutely not the method of business that the bears have done. And I think and that's a smart play. If you're going to try to do this the right way and afford yourself time to get there. I th and I think the difference is like the Bears to me, which is crazy to say, but like I look at all of those teams and I'm like, there's no depth. There was depth on the defensive side of the football. There was no offensive depth on this team. I feel like the Bears have a more offensive depth in the beginning stages of this heading into next year, right? Like I look at the Vikings. If Justin Jefferson goes down, the season's over. Like that's really how that Viking team, like if he's done, like, okay, like they don't have a number one anymore and maybe – you know, somebody steps up, but I, I I don't foresee that being the case. Not that I'm wishing that on anybody, but I see kind of right. Like I can see how the Bears have structured this where, OK, if if something should happen to DJ Moore during the season, we got a couple mm -hmm. of guys that can step up who have been the number one option on on their respective teams on this team that Justin Fields has a rapport with. The running game has three running backs in it that have all been the number one option at one point outside of Roshan Johnson, who's who's young coming into it. So I see kind of the depth offensive little a little bit more. The defensive depth is still a little bit of a question to me. Yeah, I'm not going to say that that's the answer, but I, I even there, like I can kind of see how guys fit in. They may not be the perfect fit, but I see how they fit in. Yeah, I agree with you. And I and I believe that at least now the moves make sense where yeah. it's not you're scraping from like the bottom of the barrel to try to put a roster to get a, get together yeah. to field a football team. It takes time. And it's so often like the knee jerk reaction might get you more wins than you expect, like in one season, but then you're dealing with like contracts after that, then you're dealing with quarterbacks or, you know, maybe somebody isn't as good the next, the next year. And yeah. you like, you've got to be strategic about it. And I know that some people say, well, the bears didn't try to lose, you know, uh, 14 games last year. I wouldn't, I'm not saying that they were going out there like at all, like trying to throw games or anything like that. That's not it at all, but they were not built to win no. 14 games, 14 extra games. They were built because they were, you know, had the scrap heap of players. They were trying to feel the team. And that's how you strategically get to this place where you could eventually be worst to first, but worst to first is never an overnight thing. Like with the Cincinnati yeah. Bengals, that thing began in 2019 and that was a quicker rebuild than most, but the writing was on the wall for them for a long time when they just couldn't get past the first round of the postseason. And they decided, okay, it has to be the quarterback first. Now, the Bears have the, if the Bears have the right quarterback, then they will have checked one of the biggest boxes that most teams struggle to to fill and find. Yeah. But we'll see. I I don't see worst to first for this team. I see three and fourteen to seven or eight wins, nine at the most. I I'm right there with you. Nine and I I figure nine and eight. I can see a tenth win, but I'm not confident in that tenth win. I don't know. Uh, I don't know where you're finding that tenth win. So let me there's know. there's let me see. Let me let me look at his schedule again. Let me pull up this Bears schedule. I know there was one win where I was like, I don't know. It's early enough. The Bears might be able to get this. Uh, it definitely was not. By the way, I know everybody's like, is is he talking about the? Uh, the Kansas City? No, I am not talking about Kansas City. Oh, the Chargers. I said the Chargers might be one that the Bears can get because while I have that down as a loss now, um, I'm never confident in what the Chargers do. Like, I like kind of what they're building, but I really look at that team and I'm like, wow, Phillip Rivers really passed the torch on to Justin mm -hmm. Herbert just for him to kind of become Phillip Rivers. 
Like, that's pretty impressive. I'm not going to lie. A lot of- no, I mean, new <laughs> offensive coordinator this year, somebody who's probably a little bit more competent than what they had with Joe Lombardi last year to take advantage, like the Bears, of their quarterback. Yeah, they yeah. made the postseason, but they kind of backed their way into it, and then they gave up a massive lead to the Jaguars. Like, there's a lot of things that's more than just the quarterback <laughs> play that – may fall on the shoulders of the head coach that could end up, you know, having that game fall in your favor, but we'll see, I guess by the time we get there, what is that week eight? Uh, we'll see That's if some of those eight. flaws are fixed. Let's hope not. Uh, let's keep this thing moving along. No, I'm just, I'm, I just need to see. Here's the thing. It's going to be so weird. This is the part bears fans have to also realize eight wins still isn't good. Like, but it's gonna. It's feel middle so of the pack. Good. Yeah, of course it it's is. Gonna Cause it's going to show you the so plan's good. working. It's going to show you that, Hey, <laughs> A year from now, like you take your lumps the first two years of this rebuild yeah. and three wins becomes eight wins. Does eight win be eight wins become 10 or 11 wins? And then, yep. you know, who knows from there? That's your goal. Uh, let's keep this thing moving along. No, Courtney, because we had a lot of stories that turned into absolutely nothing this off season. We've got a lot of stories still going around. Second quarter. That are uh, interesting stories that maybe are just getting a little bit too much attention. So I have my question for you. What is the biggest story twofold? One for the Chicago Bears, two for the NFL that was overblown this offseason. I'll say more recently, the idea that Chase Claypool, like it's just not going to work out and that, you know, there's a lot of concern. And I know that we've talked about it a lot and and Sylvie's reporting, like if that's what he's hearing, that's what he's hearing. And we've got to talk about it. But the idea that, you know, last year, even like when, when Claypool came in, it's like, oh my God, this guy's going to be the savior. Well, look at the team he was coming to. He was expected, or at least in the idea of the fan to come in and and elevate this receiver room that, you know, was just a mishmash of guys with poor pass protection and a quarterback who held onto the ball too long. Throw that in, throw in the fact that he like had just gotten here midway through the season and you're expecting him to pull up the play to master the playbook, like on the fly. Like those are just, honestly, it's a lot of wishful thinking. And then this off season, the idea that like something's going on and, you know, it's overblown right now because we haven't heard it from coaches. There's been no read between the lines. There's been no everything that the, that players have said, including the quarterback bringing it up unprompted when I asked him a question about something completely separate. All of that stuff is enough to le- lead you to believe maybe we're overblowing this a little bit with Claypool. So yeah. I would say until we see him struggle, and if you're a Bears fan, you hope he doesn't. You hope that he can, whatever the soft tissue, whatever it is, that he's dealing with right now, you hope by the time they report on July 25th was just over a month away that he's able to get that under control, that he's able to, to get himself healed up and he can rebuild that rapport as quickly as DJ Moore did with Justin Fields. Now the bigger story, I think, I mean, the two, the two stories that like captivated us throughout the off season were Aaron Rodgers going to the New York jets and then Lamar yeah. Jackson you know, there's a point in time where I'm like, is Lamar Jackson ever going to play for the Baltimore <laughs> Ravens again? Like, is he going to potentially sit out this season? And then lo and behold, he signs the five-year, $260 million contract. And no. he's the highest paid player in NFL history. That was in May. Or no, that was in April. It was right it before was the April. draft. So it it's like, April. it was so anticlimactic because it happened like the night before the draft or the night of day one, like of the draft, like, I just remember it was, it should have been a bigger story and not a blip on the radar that Lamar Jackson just got paid after this big standoff and, you know, sending out the tweet when we're all sitting down with John Harbaugh at owners meetings, like as he's sitting down, Lamar lets us all know he demanded a trade back in March, whatever, whatever. It all went away so quietly and we haven't heard anything (laughs) from Lamar. Like they went out, they got Odell Beckham Jr. They paid him $15 million a year, a guy coming off an ACL tear, you know, in the Super Bowl, 2021 Super Bowl. Then it's like, oh, okay. I, um, I I guess they really are committed to Lamar Jackson in his growth with a new offensive coordinator. All the signs that showed you, hey, they do believe in Lamar. They finally got him signed, and then we haven't heard from him since. So the fact that that's not, and I mean, if you're if you're looking at that, like you don't want to stand off. You want guys yeah. to get paid. You want guys to be paid what they believe they, um, you know, should be valued at. But right, right, right. It was just kind of like, okay, he got paid. Now what? 
See, Lamar's tough for me because my perspective on the whole Lamar thing is Baltimore basically just did enough to say, we did stuff for you, so you should be happy. Now go shut up and play football. Like, Odell Beckham doesn't answer. Like, yes, the Odell Beckham pre-two ACL tears, that's a great get when Lamar first wanted him. And you guys didn't want to go get him then. So he ends up on the Rams and wins the Super Bowl and tears it again. Oh, now let's go get him. It's like, I I feel like Baltimore, Baltimore is a weird one to me. It's like, I think they're going to win. I think they're going to be competitive, but I don't think that they've added enough for me to just be like, yeah, they, they fully are committed. You know, like how Ryan Poles is like, you know, we need for Justin Fields, even though he's very mobile, an offensive line, a running game, and wide receivers. I feel like with Lamar, they're just like, we'll just give you the bare minimum and you see what you can make happen out of this. Yeah, I mean, that's what happens when you have an athletic quarterback. You feel like you can get away with so much more. And, yeah. they, you know, they used a six-round pick on their left guard this year. And the the offensive line, as it is, it's a veteran group. I mean, you've got Kevin Zeitler, you've got Morgan Moses, you've got uh, Ronnie Stanley, and then Tyler Lindenbaum was your first round pick a year ago. But yeah. can that group be better? Can that group protect uh, Lamar Jackson outside of the Odell Beckham free agent signing? The rest of that group, Nelson Aguilar, like, does that really like make you jump <laughs> off the page? When when they clown in Aguilar for dropping passes while like catching people jumping out of a building, wasn't that a thing like in Philly, like? <laughs> There was like a fire in a building and they were like, yeah, we had to catch the baby and I'm glad we caught him. Unlike Nelson Aguilar, I was like, dang, like you catching shots after saving babies. That's crazy out here. But I, I want to ask you this about the Chase Claypool situation. I want to ask you more so about the front office because sure. I've always I've always had this question. How big is the front office? Because we always hear a person in the front office said this, a person in the front, especially, right, I do a lot of bull stuff. I always hear this. The front office believes this. Who's in the front office? Okay. Because AK and Mark Eversley clearly don't believe a lot of what gets put out there based on the decisions they make. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> such a broad term. I wish that we could do a little bit better as journalists. Like when you're like somebody in the front office, you know, are they in football operations? Are they in on the business side. I mean, like there's, you got to differentiate and yeah. you know, most people to protect their sources will not. And I understand that, but like the front office, like the way the bears front office is constructed, you know, Kevin Warren is the, the president and CEO. He's Ryan Poles boss. Technically, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. even though Ryan Poles controls football operations, Kevin Warren handles the business side, but Warren uh, polls reports to Warren. And that's something that Ryan wanted to happen. Like he wanted to make sure like because they, they changed the structure because of Ted's last year, George was, George McCaskey was the one that was having polls report to him. And it made more sense. Kevin has a background, very extensive background uh, on the football side of the yeah. operation. And it made sense. But beyond that, there's a lot of different people. I mean, of course, like you go right to like Ian Cunningham, who's the assistant general manager. And then you've got like your directors of player personnel, Jeff King and Trey Cozio. And then, you know, you have scouts in the front office. You have your director of college scouting. You have pro scouts. Like there's a lot of people that make up the front office. So when you hear people in the front office are saying, or a source in the front office, I think as a journalist, you've got to determine how high up is this source? Yeah. Is this source a scout? Is this source, you know, the director of pro scouting who's going through advances? Like a lot of times, like if for me in the past, if I want have a question on, you know, a player on another team, I will go to whichever scout I know has done in advance who has seen this player and ask like, Hey, what's your evaluation on, on so-and-so because yeah. those are the people who are going through watching the most film on these guys, gathering the most information and scouts are a great resource. They are good. They're, you know, they're like have a depth of knowledge on the guys that they are watching constantly. But I sometimes just caution people that like when you hear front off, you know, members of front office, like, don't don't chalk it up to making it sound like the general manager might be saying something yeah, if yeah, he's yeah. not. Now, now I'm not saying that anybody's done that, but sometimes we go front office, general manager, 
And that's when things can get kind of hairy. Um, and and this is not right. Like this is not us taking shots at Sylvie at all. Not this at is, all. This, no, is this is us literally. I, I just want to clarify this because we hear this and the fans thought process, me being the fan for years and all that. The fans thought process is, oh, Ryan Poles hates Chase Claypool. He regrets the trade. And all because videos, a lot of people assume front office and general manager, yes. which is not always the case. I mean, it depends yeah. how active your general manager of a team is in talking with media members sometimes um you know sometimes people are given in like different places people are given a little bit more flexibility to have those relationships where they're more comfortable speaking off the record on certain things and some people keep things very close to the vest now yeah. it's it's neither here nor there like how you know anything like with the chase claypool stuff because you know sylvie knows this team he was a beat reporter for a while and if Absolutely. someone's telling him something like that then 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 we listen because you know he's a voice in the city he's a prominent voice in the city so but like when i when i say like maybe that's an overblown storyline i saw him at one practice pat like that's in, in we didn't see him get injured that practice it wasn't yeah. some catastrophic thing that's going to keep him out what we know is that, according to Matt Eberflus, he's dealing with a couple things, and I don't think the Bears would talk about Claypool in such glowing fashion if they really did it. Like, there's no some, there's no sort of reverse psychology here of like, oh, I'm gonna say great things about him from the quarterback, and then he'll like get up to speed or he'll clean his act up if they didn't think he was, you know, doing the right thing. But that doesn't work. Yeah, these are professional, these are adults and professional football players. So, I, I don't think that it's a situation where you know, what we talk about, like overblowing the storyline, that it is like a rampant thing coming from the front office. But if some people have this viewpoint, it doesn't necessarily mean it reflects everybody on the Bears. Yeah, that's that's just I, I just want to get that out for every front office out there. Like I, I hear that so much. And I'm just like, who's taught who said this, though? Mm -hmm. Because the decisions that I'm seeing play out don't agree with even even with the Lamar thing. Right. Like people in the front office don't believe Lamar Jackson could be a a uh uh, franchise yeah. quarterback. Think about how many team. like an anonymous sources were cited. Then they, with, then they like, made him the highest paid quarterback. I'm like, who who didn't believe it? <laughs> it's a good the point. G, the GM there are a lot. Did. I mean, and and that that could be scouts telling you that. That could be yeah. lower level personnel, um, you know, personnel staff members, and they still are in the front office, but they might not. They very clearly aren't the people making the decision. You might be getting in the opinion of somebody like, I wouldn't pay this player that much. I mean. I remember checking in on the Saquon Barkley thing a couple weeks ago, and I asked a couple sources that I know. I'm both asking Joe Shane of the, uh, you know, of the New York Giants, but just kind of like poking around with people I know that you know have done business with the organization, though, and a couple people inside the organization. You don't run with that and say like, you know, high-ranking official in the front office. I think you have to be kind of couch that a little bit more with, here's the belief of some about why they would or wouldn't pay Saquon Barkley and kind of what he's up against. Like, yeah, that's yeah. how I think you have to frame it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, and, and I, I think that's, that is how Sylvie framed it. Yeah, that's like, absolutely. But I, I love that. I love my favorite part. Me and me and my co-host on Locked Up was, Hey, his favorite thing to do is to watch the aftermath of people who read the headline and not the story. Like, yeah. it's just like, you know, what was, what was it? Um, You know, the, the latest one was uh, Zach Levine, possibly, you know, the Bulls have a, a Zach Levine trade package that they put out there. The package basically is if you give us this and our mind is blown that you were dumb enough to give us this much stuff, we will trade you Zach Levine. And everybody ran with that. A lot of the fans and a lot of the, the, the reporters and stuff are not reporters. The, the YouTubers and stuff like that sure. were just like Zach Levine's on the move. I was like, he's not. He's not going anywhere. He's here. Like <laughs> That stuff but, happens, and I mean, when there is nothing like when when it's a slower news cycle, I yeah. think you expect that stuff to happen. I mean, I, you know, rumor season is it's all year round, really, in the NFL. Like, I mean, even during the season, there have been, you know, there. I just can remember like certain places where things pop up, and it's like, well, that's actually not true. Like, where did you hear that from? Yeah, but yeah, yeah. it's, <laughs> you know, it's the summer right now, so this, that sort of stuff. But that's a talking point for various people and podcasts and everything else to talk about. I mean, we're talking about it right now because it's content. So yeah. those are my favorite debates when you just like, where'd you hear that from? Hey man, it's out there. 
<laughs> out there. We're like, yeah, everything's wait. out there. <laughs> exactly. Oh, man. Let's get into halftime real quick. I do have to pick Courtney's brain on a nugget that I'm bringing to the channel today. Hit that like button if you haven't done so. Let us know how you feel about all the offseason topics. What was your biggest overblown story? But, Courtney, I have to ask you, am I weird? Let me finish. Leave it alone. Uh, in the sense of, so yesterday, cut the grass. And finished cutting the grass, felt gross because I was cutting the grass. Went to take a shower, took a beer with me, the shower beer. I think the shower beer is something that should be a staple in everyone's home. Drinking the beer while in a hot shower, pores are open, beer is flowing. It's the greatest thing in the world. Am I weird for drinking the shower beer? I had people on Twitter who were, you know, kind of in support of like, hey, you know, I love what you see in this. But then my friend groups hit me and was like, you shouldn't be drinking in the shower, darling. Like, you have a problem. On a like, Monday? You, you might you might be in our good. I'm not going hard in the shower. I'm not killing seven of them. But on I finished cutting the grass. Like, no, I that? mean, like, I, I will not shame anybody for anything they want to do to unwind and relax. We all have our things. I haven't had a shower beer, I want to say, since college. Like, early on in college. And... I remember like that was the, you know, the, 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 the behavior, the degenerate behavior. Like, oh, it gets you more inebriated quicker because your pores are open. So of course, as a college kid, you're like, yay. Like, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. you know, less money to drink more or less. I haven't done it in a long time. I, I mean, I think that's kind of the equivalent of people like taking a bath and having a glass of wine. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. I, I think I, it's the equivalent. So you can't hate on one and then say the other's weird. I just, you know, on a Monday. I See, here's the thing. I will say this. What I time was this? Th this is this is probably four o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. I, it, I let the sun go down. Monday I, was I, a federal holiday. So the federal holiday, off. Juneteenth out there. Yeah, I mean, keeping love. But uh, it was it was one of those things where one. First off, here's the thing. I didn't know about the pores open makes you drunker. Like I had no idea. Allegedly, I think it's an urban legend. I don't know if it's okay. actually like how much your pores really do open in the shower. Like I had no idea that was a thing. I think I saw Bill Murray do it in a movie once. And I was like, <laughs> I got to try that. Like that was the only reason I've started doing this. And I always do it only if it's after I cut the grass. Like, cause yeah. that's the time where I'm like, I'm drinking beer while I'm cutting the grass. Why stop now? I'm already on my way in there. I hit the shower for 15 minutes. Get the heck up out of there. I don't know. I felt I felt a little bit of judgment yesterday from a lot of people like, dude, you got a problem. Like, you shouldn't be drinking beers. I wouldn't say it's a shower. problem. Like, you have one <laughs> beer in the shower. Like, it's, I mean. Wait a minute. In college, were you guys crushing, like, four beers in the shower trying to get drunker because the pools were open? I just like, remember that like, that was, like, a pregame thing. Like, on Friday night, Thursday night, whatever oh, okay. night to go out, like, when you're, like, underage drinking. Like, yeah. when you're, you know, young and doing that. I definitely did that. Did not do that as a 21-year-old, <laughs> but as, like, a dumb freshman. Yeah, we all experimented. So, um, I... I don't remember how many. I just remember there were people who like really took that seriously. Like I hadn't heard what a shower beer was until going to college. Like <laughs> I think if you're going to put that up against like, you know, is it weird? Is it not? What about the people who take their phone into the shower? Okay. All right. So I'm weird now. So I, do you, I, do you have, do you take your phone in the shower, Pat? I watch TV in the shower. Okay. That's another level. Like that is out of control. Can you not just give yourself like the 10 minutes you need to take a shower? You got to be watching TV. You got to stay locked watch. in all the time. <laughs> Have, get off line. I, I have an I have an entire shower rack that I just put the phone in, that and is, I literally will sit there. And I yeah, here's the wild part: it's not even weird stuff. Like I like be in the middle of a show and be like, uh, I need to take a shower before this thing, but I'm not gonna stop. Why? Like Ted Lasso in the shower. Definitely watch Ted Lasso before in the shower. You can like DVR that, or you can watch it. Like I can on watch demand. it whenever I want. It's on Apple that TV. Is, that that <laughs> is nuts. Okay, like that, I do not sign off on. So you're on your own for that one. But the shower beer, I was, I was teetering towards giving you credit and saying it's not weird. But now that we know you bring your iPhone into the shower, yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I, okay. I, I'll give you. We have a. Here's the tough part. We have a good shower, so it's like it, it's not like the phone's getting wet. Like it's out of the water for the most part. It's actually out of the steam because I shower with the fan on because I don't want to like suffocate. Yeah, in there. I don't know. Mold. I don't. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, man. Am I, am I the only? OK, all right. well, let, let me know, know. If, if anybody else is weird in the comments below as we move past this topic. I was feeling like she was on my side for a bit. I'm I was gonna... until I found out about the TV shower. That is bizarre. <laughs> 
I listen, I, I love who was just talking about this. Steve Harvey was talking about this. He was like, the bathroom for a man is like a getaway from everything because nobody wants to be in there with you. He was like, I have a TV in there. I have a computer. Oh I can God. send emails. I have a landline. First off, he has a landline in his bathroom. That's a little weird. Uh, he's got a landline in there. He's like, you can get a lot done in the bathroom. I've done my best ideas coming up with videos and or ideas for the breeze in the shower, 110%. <laughs> I have not recorded in there for anybody. I mean, Lita, thank God. I have not. I have not. I have not done it. We drew a there. line. But drew I a did. Line. I did draw a line. Let's keep this thing moving. As uh, there's a line in the sand on these wide receivers out here, man. We got the third okay. quarter coming up. Third quarter. Oh, let's get away from the shower talk here. Yes. I felt. I felt. I was doing good. But uh, <laughs> as the position battles are heating up, heading into camp, Courtney, the wide receiver position is the most interesting to me i think we have three that realistically are solidified i mean dj Moore, we know he's going to be your number one i guess the battle for number two is up in the air between darnell mooney and chase claypool but at a minimum they're probably your two and three mm -hmm. outside of that i think your battle between saint brown dante pettis valish jones and tyler scott is going to be an interesting one for two of those guys i think more so on playtime and for the other two, possibly for making this roster, I think Bayless Jones yeah. and Dante Pettis are kind of question marks to me on, is this guy going to be a major part of this roster? Tyler Scott just got drafted. I think he's going to be there. But is he going to beat out Equinamius for playtime? Yeah. What are your thoughts on it's, the wide receiver battle heading? Can you go back to how they cut the roster down? They kept six on the active roster, and that came after they claimed Amir Smith-Marset yeah. from Minnesota. So – the way the roster looks, and I mean, when you think about like what this offense needs and, and you know, to have depth at the position, quality depth, not the depth that they had last year, you probably are thinking six guys, but positions four through six, you got to make an impact on special teams. You have to contribute. Now, I look at like the, I mean, the DJ Moore, Chase Claypool, Darnell Mooney, like even though we haven't seen Claypool and Mooney this spring, I mean, a little bit of Claypool, just leave that as is because. Right now, even with the talent, the way that, like, even with, like, the group, the way that it is and with the injuries, that talent, the way that you project it out, Mooney coming back healthy, yeah. Claypool coming back healthy from whatever he's dealing with, like, you expect that to be your upper echelon talent. Where it gets interesting is figuring out, like, who fills some of those roles on special teams. Now, when, when you talked about Tyler Scott, like, fourth-round pick, that's going to be a hard one to sneak through waivers. So that oftentimes leads to a decision – for any team like if we can't sneak him through we got to keep him on the active roster because unless you think you can get him onto your practice squad you're probably not doing that with a fourth round pick somebody who's right. speedy somebody who you know still somewhat raw at the position but you know was terrific on post routes in college he was a gunner at cincinnati so special teams contributions then it's Valus jones equinemia st brown and Dante Pettis, like the other guys, Therese Fountain, Simba Webster, um, you know, a couple other guys, Cyric Pitts had like a good day at uh, mini camp last week. Those are practice squad guys and that's yeah. fine. They'll be fine getting them there, but they're not keeping seven on the roster. So between St. Brown, Valus Jones, Tyler Scott and Dante Pettis, who, who gives you the contributions like offensively, like what do they bring? Who has a role that they can play? I mean, Equinemi St. Brown is a terrific blocker. You yeah. need somebody who's going to buy into that sort of role. And that's the reason he's a culture guy. He was with Luke Getze in Green Bay. There's a reason he was brought down here and signed last year as a free agent, re-signed last December on a one-year deal. I don't think he's going anywhere. Yeah. So then that leads you really to two people. If we're kind of project if I'm projecting Tyler Scott on the roster in St. Brown, between Dante Pettis and Valus Jones Jr., who might be the odd man out there? And we saw both of them were taking punt return reps during mini camp. No. So that's important. And this battle is going to come down to the special teams contribution. So when all of you are out at training camp, you know, it's going to be intriguing to watch what they're doing offensively. And then, you know, seeing these guys getting reps with the second team and building out what that looks like. Yeah. Keep your eye on who's getting the special teams reps. Keep your eye on these preseason games. Who's taking first punt, re punt return reps, um, you know, who's, you know, who's the gunner, like all these things, because those are the roles that you look further down a couple of positions, cornerback, wide receivers, sometimes with running backs, you look further down the depth chart and say, okay, if these guys, 
can't make a contribution on their offensive or defensive position, their value to this team, if they make it on the roster, is via special teams. So there's that. But there's also the caveat that Velas Jones Jr. was a third-round pick a year ago. The Bears kind of have to justify that and give it every last chance they possibly can to mm. make sure – they can say confidently that they didn't just give up on a third round pick, um, you know, or that he was, you know, they don't want to like have the bus label. And yeah. I, and I understand that, but it's, that one is going to be one to watch between Vela's age with and him Dante is tougher Pettis. though, right? Yeah, he's 26 years old. 26. I mean, like you, I, I thought this is, I broke this video down over on the breeze too. And, and this to me was the, the biggest question mark between these guys, right? Like, to me, Tyler Scott, even no matter what you think about him as what the final product is, he's 21. Mm -hmm. And he's barely, I mean, he, <laughs> he was a converted, like he was an he was recruited to Cincinnati as an athlete. So he played yeah. a bunch of different positions and he's relatively inexperienced, but high yeah. ceiling, high reward guy at the wide receiver position. So the bears look at that. They see an athlete. They, they take a gamble much more willingly. Um, you know, on a player like that than somebody that they could have looked out into free agency and, and signed on a short-term deal because they think they can build around him and like yeah. build with him into the overall product offensively. Now, the good thing for Valus is, right, like he is still younger than Dante Pettis by a year. The tough part to me is Dante Pettis, at least based on what I saw on the field last season, is just better than Valus. Now, I know everybody's going to say, of course he is. He's a rookie. Valus gets the rookie, like, you know, expectations but at the same time when you're drafting an older player that guy's got to make an impact quicker because you're not going to get as much football time out of him you're not going to mm -hmm. get as much of, by the time he's going to be up for contract he'll be like almost 29. 29 yeah like are, like and that's something he, that you have to factor in no 100 percent. and we know that he he made some costly mistakes last year you go back to the washington yeah. game with the fumbled punt and then, of course, uh, you know, the Giants game two weeks before that, like yep. on the road, these special teams blunders cannot happen again if Bayless Jones wants to cement himself on this team. Because, you know, regardless of draft status at that point, you know, teams are much more willing to part ways with somebody who they're like, man, you're just not getting it right. And then yeah. they're not trying to like drag the guy, but like Amir Smith Marset. You know, think about what happened with him. <laughs> Fifth round pick from Minnesota. He, you know, he definitely, when he got cut up there, was two, he had a rough rough start. He was COVID year rookie, fifth round pick. Mike Zimmer didn't like to play rookies, you know, didn't really think much of him. He never really got much of an opportunity, and I believe he got hurt yeah. too. And then, you know, just didn't fit in with the pretty deep receiver room with Justin Jefferson, Adam Thielen, KJ Osborne last year. He gets cut. He comes here. You make a special teams mistake, or like you make a you make a mistake like that, and he made it actually. He was remember, I mean, it, take the special teams thing out. I misspoke there. So when Justin Fields hits him, and he's just all he's got to do on the left side down play, he's yep. just got to go out of bounds, and he tries to do too much by cutting back in, and then Cam Dantzler punches the ball out, and then they return that like that. That's the play right there that got him cut. Yeah. And it stinks for him because it's kind of like, man, you have such a short leash. But when you are drafted later on, you do have a shorter leash because there aren't the guarantees. Financially, there's not the obligation to pay you as much as the other guys. And teams are OK just parting ways. I think he's on the Chiefs now, though. So he, he is. Yeah, he, he, he failed up. I, I, that's it. I was like, I was like, you went to a Chiefs team. We're like, I don't know if I could tell you who they're best wide receiver is. Well, I could tell you who their best receiver is. It's, it's Kelsey by far. But like. Mm -hmm. I look at that wide receiver room and I'm just like, Pat Mahomes will figure it out. Like yeah. he'll turn somebody into a superstar. Hopefully it is Smith Marset. The one thing that I, I guess here's the, the final question on this, right? Like is Valus Jones behind Dante Pettis right now, as far as where the bears are probably feeling about him continuing to be on the roster. Cause Pettis, I believe also just got signed right before. Let me see. I don't think mini camp. I thought I thought they gave Pettis a contract to bring him back on. Maybe I'm wrong on that, but it wasn't. If it was, yeah, he got. So he knew Tyke Tolbert. So yeah, this was April. It was a one year thing, and I just remember yeah, yeah, it was kind yeah. of a blip on the radar. He was in New York with Tyke Tolbert, so that's how like he made that connection initially. And that's somebody when you're trying to fill out, 
you know, mishmash of wide receivers last yeah. year. It's like, hey, cheap option, somebody who Tyke trusts. Otherwise, you wouldn't bring him in. Right. So is Velas behind him? If I'm looking at this logically, I'm thinking that Velas probably has a little bit of a step up only because of the contract, because the Bears are going to try to justify that thing and give this guy yeah. every last opportunity to prove he – can make this roster, make an impact, and that make them look like, oh, we didn't just waste a third-round pick a year ago on a guy we thought was a speed guy that ended up not being at all. Like, if they you know, if they completely botch that pick, that's going to come back to the front office, and they don't want to look like they really screwed that one up. Yeah, I, I just I, – ho- I hope Valus can make it work. I'm not one of those people that buys into the – well, remember at the end of the season, he caught that pass, the deep shot from Justice, like – he caught a football as a wide receiver like that. That's uh that's his job. I don't know if yeah. y'all know that or not. So we'll see. We'll see. Hopefully uh, that all plays itself out in the right direction. Dante. Pe- so he did get re-signed, like you said, in April for a, a, it's yeah. a million dollar deal. basically. Yeah, it's a vet it's deal. a million. Do- yeah, he's he. So they, they would be fine moving on with that. Um, I don't know. Let's hope everybody keeps their job. That's, I guess that's the goal. There's somebody seven, there's seven right now that are competing for probably six spots. So somebody's going to yeah. be the odd man out. Somebody's going to be the odd man out there. Uh, let's finish it out with this one real quick. The Bears, according to NFL.com, have the fifth biggest hole at the defensive end position. And while NFL, I mean, like, we're not going to sit here and have a full-on conversation on defensive end yet again, even though we're going to have one pretty much every week until we sign one. But here's my question to you. The top 10, you have the Bears... Baltimore also needs an edge rusher. New Orleans mm-hmm. needs an edge rusher. New Orleans needs a defense. But New Orleans needs an edge rusher. Jacksonville needs an edge rusher. Kansas City needs an edge rusher. Courtney, are the Bears going to miss out just based on the fact that Some there's other- a lot of teams that are in better positions to yeah. win right now? I mean, that definitely is possible. And again, I think I mentioned this at the top of the show. You go back to what Paul said after free agency when we're like, okay, like, you, you, you know, Defensive tackle market was too expensive. So they yeah. ended up going, you know, they got I mean, the you know pass rusher part of that. So they ended up going to the draft to find that they signed Andrew Billings, whatever, like, but they didn't want to get out bit. They didn't want to like get into that bidding war. And then you notice, okay, well, there is still some holes at the defensive end spot. And polls was very adamant that there's going to be some weak spots on the roster. Guys who are still remaining in free agency, like of the best like defensive ends out there, like the free agents, it depends what their age is going to be. Like we've talked a lot about unique and Gakwe and guys who are, you know, currently available. I don't know if they're going to, they're going to, some players are going to want to go where they can get paid the most. Now, yep. will the bears overpay for somebody? I I feel like we've seen them not, not do that. Yeah, like, probably not. Um, but like, Look at the guys that are currently on the market. It's pulled it like in where their age is too. Robert Quinn. Is he coming back here? I don't really think so. Unique and Gakwe, uh, Jadavian Clowney, Matthew Ioannidis, Akeem Hicks, like Al Kadim Muhammad's still out there. The guy the Bears cut in January. Like the market's not great. So these would be those eleventh hour towards training camp sort of moves that you would expect to happen. There's no more. I mean, unless they traded for somebody, there's no marquee name that you can say, oh, wow, the Bears could outbid this team because what what are they offering free agents? Most of these pass rushers are in that just entering their prime or already in it, like the 28, 29-year-old cusp of being on the other side of 30, which is when most pass rushers, especially, you know, edge rushers, hit their prime. Yeah. I I think they're in a tough spot based on those teams that you mentioned where Kansas City, no-brainer. If you want to go ring chase, go to Kansas City. The Saints could end up surprising a lot of people in a division that feels up for grabs, and it feels that like the Saints are going to grab it. Um, who are you know the Los Angeles Rams? They were another team you mentioned. The as Rams, well? the Rams are all the way. <laughs> the Rams are number two. It just says entire defense. Yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, it Rams, makes sense. Like, you and I were talking before the pod. Like how many guys are not there anymore? Bobby Wagner, yeah. um, you know Leonard Floyd, uh, A. Sean you know, Robinson, Ram- Greg Gaines, yeah, Jalen Ramsey, Taylor Rapp, like. <laughs> Aaron Donald's by himself now. He's just got to look around the room pretty much. Yeah. That's... It's that it's that Will Smith. Aaron Donald's now that Will Smith uh, meme where he's just like, it's the last episode of Fresh Prince. He's just standing there alone <laughs> looking off to the side. It's Aaron Donald now. Yeah. I mean, 
Sometimes I wonder if you wish he would have retired considering what this team looks like, but they're again, they're a team that's biting the bullet for this year. Cause they know that they have to get their cap healthy in order to be able to contend next year. So that could also put them, you know, if the bears are, you know, fighting down the line to like yeah. try to like fix this hole, like, and it ends up becoming like the difference of a couple million dollars. Maybe they do, but it has to be somebody. They don't want these one year deals anymore. Yeah. And hear how guys talked about the, you know, Justin Jones, when he mentioned last week, the players who were here on one year contracts, more or less like the prove it we, deals. We don't you want don't, guys who don't want to be here. You, like, they, well, the team wants players they can build around and players <laughs> yeah. that they feel they can keep here a long time to like be part of something going forward. So that's going to, that's going to factor into like how they calculate those moves this off season, if it is worth doing it, or if you're just going to try to roll out what you have and expect that that's going to be the weak spot on your roster and try to compensate for it elsewhere. I mean, it's, no one's saying it's going to be easy if they go that route, but that is a potential for them to do that. Is it leaning more than likely that the Bears either trade or go into the season just with what they have than signing somebody? They keep saying, like publicly speaking, like I know that polls at one point was on recently with Black and Abdallah talking yeah. about it. Matt Eberflus had mentioned it. That like he you know kind of like paraphrasing here but like you know floated the idea that yeah it's a possibility we could do it before training camp. I don't see how they go into like without signing someone. It might not be a marquee name that's out there, but someone to fill that void because right now it's you, know, you didn't hear much about Travis Gibson and Dominique Robinson throughout the spring. At you, all. you didn't. You heard a little bit about Demarcus Walker, and that's why they brought him in. The inside outside flexibility he has, but what about the other side of the line? Like how are they going to try to? make this work and it's not a defense that blitzes really a whole ton so it's not like you can expect that you're getting the pressure in places that are like non you know they may be a little bit more unorthodox so they've got to get if they want to pressure with four down linemen they've got to fix one of the gaps that they have right now at ed rusher yeah we'll see what the bears do i I like at a minimum we're not one of the teams that has entire defense (laughs) there's a couple of them on here that's a that's a bad play. Or even, you know, I, I'll say there's some teams on here, like the Saints are on here. Defensive line. Like that you don't have any, like all four. Okay. All right. That's that's a tough spot to be. We've been there. We were there. We're not there anymore. Good to hear. Hey, that's another edition of the Chicago Bears podcast. Appreciate you guys for tuning in and rocking with us. As you always do, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the page, and stay tuned in with us all week as we still got five days of content coming your way. Well, four days this week because of the holiday. Four days of content coming your way. We're five days a week, Monday through Friday. For Courtney Cronin, I'm Pat the Designer. Back at it again. Y'all stay safe out there, Chicago. Bear it on. Peace.